Is it almost time to say good morning? Yeah. No, not yet? Fifteen seconds. Fifteen seconds to good morning. We're on countdown. Are you going to do a countdown? i got to get rid of my mask here. La, 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 da, la, 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 Good morning. <laughs> there you go. Now it's time, right? Because we're bang on time, ready to go. Here we all are. And uh, you're all looking marvelously marvelous. And uh, so it's good to have you here. Now, up here. That's, that'll be better. And you can stay seated, remain seated. And uh, sing along here. God is good all the time. Amen? Amen. Amen. God is good. Even though you are here, Lord, we want you to know that you are welcome. And I ask, Father, that you just flow in and through each and every one of us. That you lift us up, that you hear our prayers, that you hear our voices, that you hear our thoughts, Lord. And that you enjoy them. And that you give to us words of encouragement, words of rebuke if need be. But that you just speak to us, Lord. Renew us, refresh us for the week ahead to come. And we will thank you. And we'll do that in Jesus' precious and holy name. Amen. Amen. If you are able to stand, and just like Debbie demonstrated, right, when you popped up, excellent, the knees go straight, the legs, right? Awesome. That's the hint. When I say, you know, as you're standing, you're actually supposed to do it. You're still not! Am <laughs> I speaking another language? I don't know. <laughs> if you need to sit down at any time, feel free to do that. 
Amen. You may be seated. I'm going to sing a song. I invite you to sing along uh, with me together, and uh, and we'll just praise. Uh, we're just going to praise the Lord here, and uh, the blood will never lose its.
there. And it reminds me of, of Elijah in the mountain, in the cave, sitting there worried. And God's voice is not in the earthquake or the fire or the wind, anything else. But when he was quiet before the Lord, when he started to listen, God whispered to him. And as we pray and as we prepare our hearts for prayer, God wants to hear from you all of your prayers, big and small. And he wants to speak into your heart. And the only way to do that is to stop worrying about what's going to happen after church service. Stop fussing on whatever happened before the church service. And just purge your minds of that stuff. Tear the strongholds down, the walls down, and listen. Listen for God's voice. In the sea.
And Lord, we, we invite you to hear our voice. Incline your ear, Father, that you might hear us. Help us to be quiet before you, to open our eyes to see, our ears to hear, our hearts and minds to receive what you would have for us today. Father, we want to glorify you with all that we say and all that we do, however we act and however we react, Lord. Father, I lift Al to you, who's suffering from this cancer. We continue to ask for healing, Lord. Because you've asked us to, to lift to you the big things, the things that we cannot do. We cannot fix this, Lord, but you can. And so we praise and honor you and lift Al to you and lift Rana to you as well. Or move in their household. They have people moving in at the end of the month into the basement. Lord, I just ask that you orchestrate everything from day to day so that everyone can live in harmony, Lord. This is what I ask. Father, I pray for a, not so much a friend, but as someone I trust for a Kenny Lehman, my, my mechanic, Lord, who fell off a ladder and fractured his hip. Uh, Lord, help him to get better, Lord. Um, just, uh, it's hard to find honest people, honest mechanics, honest merchants, Lord. And uh, I believe he's one of those. Father, there are people here that are suffering perhaps financially or physically or mentally or relationally, might be even spiritually, Lord, what they're suffering. Father, you know each and every one of us intimately. Your word says that you hear us every second, every minute, every hour, every day. And so that you know what's going on in our lives, Lord. But in obedience, we want to reveal and lift that to you. That you might answer our prayers. Father, I believe with every fiber of my being. That as we lift our prayers to you, that the power comes down from the very gates of heaven upon the object of our prayer. And the blessings, Lord, will flow back upon us. And so as we lift our prayers in faith, at the same time we open our hearts to receive the blessings from our faithfulness. You are a beautiful, powerful, all-knowing, all-seeing, graceful, merciful God. And I thank you for this and so much more. Be with our congregation. Be with those who could not be here today for whatever reason. Let them know that they are loved. That they are not alone, not abandoned. They are loved, by, not just by you, but by us. And then we desire to have them soon. For those who are staying away because of the pandemic, Lord, I ask that you, that you bring them in, that we can keep them safe, Lord, that we can gather together again. And for our friends, Carolyn and Terry, and down in Louisiana, and I don't know if my friend is still in Florida or back up to the New York area, but uh, Lord, they're part of our family. Father, I know it's odd in this day and age of computers and Facebook things, but as you know, we have 155 people that touch base with our church, touch base with our faith family, touch base with what we are doing, what you are doing through us, Lord. And I ask, Father, that you convict, that you correct, that you love, that you lift up, that you reach out and make a difference in the lives of those who touch base with our lives here, Lord. And I thank you for this in Jesus' precious and holy name. Sing that together once again. Oh, the blood
that song, the blood will never lose its power. Just amazing, isn't it? Just amazing. We have been talking for a while on love, and we are going to talk about love for some time to come. And what we are talking about is every aspect, every characteristic of what might be an agape love. Now, the one thing that you need to do is that you need to honestly reflect on your own lives as we talk about this love over the next month or so to come. We have talked about a love of kindness and a love of patience, and we're going to talk about jealousy today. But we need to be critically honest with ourselves. We need to be able to look in the mirror and say, God, what are you trying to teach me about love? What are you trying to correct in my life that I might be doing wrong? What are you trying to lift me up and say, you know, well done, you're doing good. I want to encourage you. I want to love you through this. We won't know unless we're honest with ourselves because we can fool ourselves. We can deceive ourselves. It's very easy to do. And so as we move forward with this, if you can't look, now, I don't know what's happening in your life. Some of you do, some of us do, I, I don't. And, and anything you've shared with me stays in the back of my head. Lois doesn't even ask. All Lois says is, how was, your, how was your visit? How was your, that's it. Not saying it was either good or it was okay or whatever. She never asked. So I want to assure you again that when we talk, Whatever you say stays. Stays. And so if you need to talk about different things, different aspects of love, reach out to someone that you know, someone you can confide in, or give me a call. Either way, if you don't self-reflect, if you don't honestly look at your lives each time we talk about different parts of love, you will not gain anything. And what we want you to do is do that. Open your ears to hear, open your eyes to see, open your hearts and minds to receive what God has for you, honestly. And you will grow, you will benefit, you will mature. You will grow in holiness, you will grow in sanctification. It will be worth the self-reflection. It will be worth looking at yourself honestly. I, I love this poem by Annie Johnson Flint, and uh, she wrote this in the 1800s, and she wrote this from a chair, a wheelchair, and when she was older, and she said of this particular poem, I didn't think about anything, I didn't sit down to write anything particular, I put pen in hand, or quill in hand, and God just wrote this for me. God hath not promised skies always blue, flowers strewn, pathways all our lives through. God hath not promised sun without rain, joy without sorrow, peace without pain. But God has promised strength for the day, rest for the labor, light for the way, grace for the trials, help from above, unfailing sympathy, undying love. God has not promised we shall not know toil and temptation, trouble and woe. He has not told us we shall not bear many a burden, many a care. God has not promised soothed roads and wide, what swift, easy travel, needing no guide, never a mountain, rocking steep, never a river, turbid and deep. But, but, God has promised strength for the day, rest for the labor, light for the way, grace for the trial. Help from above, unfailing sympathy, undying love. I would invite you to take this poem, although you're going to hear it every week, it's on the back of your bulletin. Stick that on the fridge with a magnet. And if you can, look at yourself in the mirror in the morning. Be honest with yourself. And then read this. 
it will give you a good place to start your day. 1 Corinthians 13, 4-7. We're going to say that together because that's what this is all about. 1 Corinthians 13, 4-7. Let's read it together. We'll also have it on the screen. Love is patient. Love is kind and is not jealous. Love does not brag and is not arrogant. Does not act unbecomingly. It does not seek its own. Is not provoked. Does not take into account a wrong suffering. Does not rejoice in unrighteousness. But rejoices in truth. Bears all things. Believes all things. Hopes all things. Endures all things. Here's where we go. I talked to you before the service. <laughs> Two shopkeepers. Don't disappoint, don't disappoint me, please. I love you. Two shopkeepers. <laughs> That's a preemptive tip. <laughs> Two shopkeepers across the road from each other. They were rivals. They were jealous of what each other had done. When someone had someone come into the shop, they'd have that Cheshire smile that you want to just, right? And they'd back into the place with the customer. They'd keep account of it. When the person on the other side did the same thing, they would smile at the person across the road. And they would, they would sort of, with proud, wide shoulders, take someone into their shop. They were jealous of each other, envious of each other. One day, an angel visited one of them. The angel said, I am here to give you anything that you want. Anything. If you want money, I'll give you riches untold. But understand this. Whatever you ask for, whatever I give you, I will give the person across the street twice as much. Do you want health and good life? If you do, I will give you a long, healthy life. But I'll do twice as much for the person across the road. I will give them twice the life and twice the goodness of life. So think carefully. What would you like? The shopkeeper thought. He looked at the angel. He said, I want you to strike me blind in one eye. It's a slow burner, isn't it? If I'm blind in one eye and I do twice as much as the person across the street, they're going to be blind in what? Both eyes! <laughs> I, I try. I try. I try. Just want to lift the moment for a second. Just, it's, it's no good if you have to write a road map. Just, oh. Thomas Lindbergh, who told this story, said one of the signs of jealousy is when it's easier to show sympathy and weep with those who weep than it is to exhibit joy and rejoice with those who rejoice. We are going to look at jealousy in its many facets. We're going to look at God's jealous love. We're going to look at our love that ought not to be jealous for those around us and should not be jealous for ourselves. The dictionary defines jealousy in this Way, a feeling of resentment against someone because of that person's rivalry, success, or advantages. And it's characterized by fears and envious resentment. Another dictionary says this. It's a feeling of showing an obvious resentment to someone uh, about their achievements or possessions or their perceived advantages. Both of these look in a negative light at jealousy. That being said, how do we talk about jealousy? How do we talk about God's jealousy? And what is it different? So let's look first at God and his jealousy. Now, the first reference of God's jealousy in the scriptures show up in the Ten Commandments. Not only once, twice down off the mountaintop, right, with the commandments. And God gives ten commandments. And the commandments are pretty straightforward. It is, there's only one God. Get over it, right? 
Do not make an idol or graven image of that God. Don't take the Lord's name in vain. How do you do that? If you're not talking to God or about God, you're taking God's name in vain. Keep the Sabbath. Honor your mom and dad. Don't kill. Don't commit adultery. Don't steal. Don't bear false witness against your neighbor. And don't covet their stuff. So with all of these commandments, God, speaking of jealousy, a righteous jealousy, hones in on number two that we read here in the book of Exodus chapter 20, verses 4 and 6. It reads this way. You shall not make for yourself an idol or any likeness of what is in heaven above or on earth beneath or in the water underneath the earth. You shall not, remember what I told you, what is in the Navy? Right? You could do this, you might do this. You know. When the word shall came up, that was carved in granite. There was no change. And it says here, you shall not worship them or serve them, for I, the Lord your God, is, I'm what? Am a jealous God. Visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children to the third and fourth generations to those who hate me. But showing loving kindness to thousands to those who love me and keep my commandments. One God, no graven image, not taking his name in vain. Keep the Sabbath, honor mom and dad, don't kill, don't commit adultery, don't steal, don't bear false witness, and don't covet your neighbor's stuff which was taken into the new covenant by Jesus as to love God with all your mind, heart, soul, strength, all of it, and love others as you love yourself. This revelation of God's jealousy comes from God to them as he has redeemed them from Egypt and is taking them into the promised land. We see that jealousy spill over into the new covenant. 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verses 21 and 22. You cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of demons. That's pretty straightforward, is it not? You cannot partake of the table of the Lord and the table of the demons. Remember the table? It makes so much sense to me when I read about that. We read about the table in the 23rd Psalm. And the table said, remember... If, if you broke bread with someone, if you set a table for them, you were honor-bound to protect them with your life. You would do whatever it took. We looked at Lot in Sodom, who sent his only daughters out to these men, and then stood outside the door himself. He would do anything. We think horrible about what he did, but he was honor-bound to do whatever he could to protect us. When God lays a table before us, when you read the 23rd Psalm, I know I'm drifting a little bit here, but when we see the valley of the shadow of death, it's really in the ancient Hebrew text called the Psalm of Sweat. Psalm of yeah, Psalm of Sweat. Boom, I mean my life. Psalm of Sweat. And what it was was not just a valley, it was this big V. And behind you, sheer rocks. You were cornered in. The enemy was coming in. You were cornered in the corner here. There was nowhere to escape. God does what? He prepares a table between you and the enemies. And even though you're cornered in there, you are protected by God. Do you want to be protected by God? Or do you want the devil fighting for you? Because if the devil's fighting for you, this is something you don't want. This is something you don't want to be beholden to him for. You cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of the demons. You cannot partake of the table of the Lord, good and beautiful as it is, and the table of demons. Or do we provoke the Lord to jealousy? We're not stronger than he, are we? And then again in the book of James, chapter 4 and 1 to 10, it's pretty busy up here on the screen. There's a couple of pages. You can look in your own scriptures. What is the source of quarrels and conflicts among you? <coughs> Is not the source of your pleasure that wage war in your members? You lust and do not have, so you commit murder. You are envious and cannot obtain, so you fight and quarrel. You do not have because you do not ask. You ask and do not receive because you ask with the wrong motives. So that when you spend it on your pleasure, you adulterous, 
Don't you know that friendship with the world is hostility towards God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Or do you think that the scripture speaks to no purpose? He jealously desires the spirit which he has made to dwell in you and me. He gives a greater grace. And therefore it says, God is opposed to the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Submit therefore to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Be miserable and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned into mourning and your joy into gloom. Humble yourselves in the presence of the Lord and he will exalt you. What does it mean when God is a jealous God? Especially if we're called to love without jealousy. It makes sense, doesn't it? On one hand and on the other hand, it doesn't. God's clearly able to love us with a jealous love that is not sinful, that is not unrighteous. His motives are good and pure. But thousands of years have taught us as human beings, we are jealous and it is not sinless and it is not pure and it is envious and dangerous. God never loves us with a jealous love because he's needy or greedy or covetous or because he's lazy or unwilling to put forth whatever ne effort necessary to, to, to accomplish his purposes. He's never jealous because of that. God is not jealous because he takes pity on certain individuals or begrudges our achievements. God is jealous because he made us, he loves us, created us, molded us, and desires for us to stay with him. And when we wander, he's jealous. But it's not a sinful jealousy. It's a true jealousy of unbridled love for us. Can God love us with a jealous love? Yes, he can. Yes, he can. What about a marriage? The marriage between God and the people of Israel, the marriage between Jesus and the church, us today, is a model of the relationships that we have. If you are married, if you have a significant other, your love is going to come with a small portion of jealousy. You'll be jealous of what you have. If it starts to drift away and you know who's taking that away, or if you know what situation is happening, you're jealous about what that person or what that situation is doing. That love and that jealousy come together. There's a small part of healthy jealousy that happens in our relationships. But the problem is that jealousy quickly turns to envy if the things are not resolved. Love should be jealous. But it's never pure as human beings. I challenge you as you search your minds this morning. In your life, have you been jealous in a way that's not so good? Has there been a dark side to your love or your jealousy in the past? And remember, we're talking children through puberty, through young adulthood, through retirement, through all of these things. I am certain that there are times when your jealousy has been unhealthy for you or for those around you. But if you are sitting there thinking to yourself, you don't know what you're talking about, Pastor, I've never been jealous, then you're lying to yourself because we're human beings. 
All sin and fall short of God's glorious standard. It's not an excuse to do things wrong, but it tells us that we're human and we make mistakes. But the only mistakes we make that are good for us are the ones that we own up to. If you don't own up to it, it's going to repeat itself over and over and over again. Let's pretend we're in front of that mirror right now. Ask yourself these questions. Be honest. Do I find that I'm happy for others when they achieve success? Do I find that I'm happy for others when they achieve success? Does someone around me have something I don't have and I want? Bigger house, bigger boat, bigger toys, right? Does another person's success make me feel unhappy? Do I feel the need to somehow lessen someone else's achievements or success with what I say or what I do, how I act and how I react? Do I judge someone else to make myself feel better? Agape love is not a jealous love. It appreciates and blesses those around us. We are to love people with a love that is not jealous. And if we have some jealousy within us, we're going to have to deal with it. A love that is unpleasing to others is a jealous love. Now there's a destructive love as well. Love when it's unchecked, a, or jealousy when it's unchecked, always leads to envy. I'm jealous of what you have, now I become envious of what you have or what I don't have or what you've done or what I haven't done or where I am in life and where I'm not. And envy leads to a dark corridor. It really does. You might say that envy is not such a bad sin. It is, but you know, and I would say this, envy killed Abel. Envy sold Joseph into slavery in Egypt. And envy put Jesus on the cross. It's right here in the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 27, verses 15 to 18. Now at the feast, the governor was accustomed to release for the people any one prisoner whom they wanted. At that time, they were holding a notorious prisoner called Barabbas. And so when the people gathered together, Pilate said to them, Whom do you want me to release for you? Barabbas or Jesus, who is called the Christ? For he knew that because of envy, they had handed him over. God's word will remove that beam in your eye, if only the truth you'll readily apply. It will take that beam of vanity and pride and help you see your own faults inside. God's word will expose that beam in your sight, if only the truth you'll see in his light. It will reveal that beam of spitefulness and envy and help you to see their own worst enemy. God's word will unmask that beam in your soul, so judgment of others you'll learn to control. Deborah Ann Belka. The Gospel of Matthew, chapter 7, verses 1 and 5, talks about a beam and an eye. And I want you to picture this. The Greek word for beam, right? So speck and eye, beam and eye, is a, the main joist, the main support beam of a house. Now, if you go down to our basement there on Devon's Drive, that thing's about that wide, about that tall. I, I don't know, four trees must have been used. To, maybe they dragged that thing from B.C. I don't know. It's massive. It's massive. And so when, 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 when the Scripture's talking, it's talking about not a, the beam they're talking about. This is significant. You can't miss this one. The Gospel says this. Do not judge so that you will not be judged. For the way you judge, you will be judged. And by your standard of measure, it will be measured to you. Why do you look at the speck that's in your brother's eye, but do not notice the log that's in your own eye? Or how do you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye, and behold, the log is in your own eye? You hypocrite! First take the log out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to take the speck out of your brother's eye. Jealousy 
can quickly become a log, a main beam in your eye, if you allow it. It can lead you to treat people poorly. It can lead you to treat people unfairly. It can lead you to treat people with a love that is, that is just not, it's disingenuous, it's not real, it's fake. It sounds good, but there's no substance to it. It's just a shell. That's what envy does. And this jealousy, this envy, unchecked, will stop you and prevent you from truly loving someone else. I've said before and I've said it again. God cannot do through us what He cannot do in us. And if He cannot do a work of love within you, you will be unable to truly love with patience, love with kindness, and love without jealousy. What will help you become free from jealousy and to love better? First, this. You must own it. Uh... You know, sometimes we pretend that we're not jealous. Sometimes we use other words for jealousy to make us feel better. You have to own it. If you have a moment of jealousy, it's life. It happens. It happens, right? Now remember this. Remember. You are not in control of your emotions. You're not. Whether you dislike or are you frustrated or happy or sad or angry or or jealous or envious or whatever the feelings are you have them you can't control them there's nothing you can do with the feelings in your body what you can do is control how you react to those feelings and so if you are jealous of what someone else has done or envious of what someone else has done you can go to God. You can control what comes out of your mouth. How you act and how you react. You can still love somebody with a love of no jealousy if you allow and reflect and understand what's going on and allow God to help you react in a proper way. Own it. Confess. Number two, confess your jealousy to God. And ask God your forgiveness and to help you control that. Third, you need to take time for your blessings. I've told you before, I've been, I spent a lot of time in Africa. And uh, let me give you a picture of one village. It took, like we flew in and we flew in a smaller plane and then we went in on a Jeep thing and then we went on by foot. This place is off the beaten trail. And we stayed on the path because there were scorpions in the grass on either side. So that made it interesting right off the bat. No one was playing soccer on the grass. We got to this village. There was a fire pit in the middle. There were thatched huts or mud huts. No one slept inside because it was too hot. They slept outside or on a branch of a, of a tree or on a thatched mat or whatever. Women with big sticks pounding one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three. Cassava root and other roots uh, for supper. No running water. No toilets, no plumbing, no nothing. No medicine. Too far from a doctor. If something happened, something happened. This is how up to 80% of the planet lives. 80% of the planet lives this way. Whether it's in Africa or Asia or Central or South America or in the Philippines somewhere. It's unbelievable. And so what you need to do, if you're jealous or envious of someone else, you need to put things into perspective. Right? I can turn the water on the tap and have clean water. I can go to the fridge and get something to eat. I can get in a vehicle and drive or someone will give me a lift. I have so much more than the vast majority of the planet. And that should help you to deal with some jealousy and some envy. Ask yourself this question, does jealousy steal your joy? Listen to this words from the Proverbs, Proverbs 14 and 30. A tranquil heart is life to the body, but passion is rottenness to the bones. What is that verse trying to tell us? It tells us this, a tranquil heart is life to the body, but envy rots the bones. A heart of peace gives life to the body, but envy rots 
the bones. A peaceful heart leads to a healthy body. Jealousy is like cancer in the bones. A tranquil heart gives life to the flesh, but envy makes the bones rot. It's as simple as that. Jealousy steals like a thief your joy and your happiness. If you find yourself jealous and you can't get rid of it, it will tie you, it will chain you to the ground and rob you of the life that God wants for you, the abundant and eternal life. I often go on about people come to church. You have one 10,080 minutes in a week and I only want about 60 or 70 of them, right? Life is precious on this earth. Why would you surrender even 60 seconds to envy or jealousy? Why would you surrender anything that would start your bones rotting? Envy makes you want and wanting leads to withholding. Envy leads you to withhold your time, your talent, your treasure, your touch. Not only for the church, but for people in the church and people in our communities. We need to understand the jealousy within. I don't know if Lois had it out there. There it is. The big green eye. We call it the one-eyed monster, right? The big green eye of jealousy. Every now and then. <laughs> Maybe you can now. It's pretty clear. That if you're feeling a little envious, if you're feeling a little jealous about someone else or about someone... You know, some situation, you need to, in your mind's eye, picture this green, big green eye. And say, I don't want that in my life. Why is it blue or black or green or hazel? Not this kind. This is envy green. This is. We are comforted today by the words of Reverend Richard Christian Halverson, which you'll hear all the time. There is nothing you can do to make God love you more. And there's nothing you can do to make God love you less. You need to honestly reflect in your life. Do I have a love that is patient for God, for other people, and for myself? Do I have a, life that is, a love that is kind to God, to other people, and to myself? Do I understand God's jealous love? For me, do I understand that I should not have a jealousy for other people in my life and certainly shouldn't be jealous of myself? Are you jealous of yourself for what you could have been or could have done in life? I wanted to be a pilot. I wrote a poem. Even my siblings remember the poem today. It's really weird. They recited it for me. I forgot they knew. They said, go back to school and finish your high school. I didn't. I wasn't a pilot. I'm not a pilot. I'm a sailor. Now I'm a preacher. If I was jealous about what I could have done and didn't do for whatever the reasons, that would rob me of life. If I was jealous of that, it would take away what I do have, a loving wife, a beautiful family, a beautiful faith family, a church that I love, a people that I love. If I was back in a pilot out of jealousy, wanted to do that, this would be gone. Gone. I could have looked up and taken better care of my body. I did that for a while, and then I didn't, and then here we are, right? Am I jealous about what I had? When I was competing in judo, I was pretty fit. I can be jealous of what I had. And beat myself up, look in the mirror and say, oh, you're a fat guy, look what you've done, you should be better, you should lose weight, you should do this, you should do that. That is jealousy of what I had. Are you jealous of your missed opportunities? When you look back in life and see the things that you could have done that you didn't do, are you jealous of those things? And you shouldn't be because you wouldn't be here where you are today. The big green eye monster can look outward and it can look inward and it should do neither. And remember what else Haverson said? He said this, God's love is unconditional, impartial, everlasting, infinite, perfect. Say to yourself, 
I have this issue or I have that issue or I did have that issue and I hope I don't have it in the future. Be honest with yourself. Because like he said, God can never love you any more or less than he loves you now. And that should bring comfort to you. Father, Lord, there are so many parts of this love, Lord, that we are discovering. So many moving parts, so many spinning wheels. Yet you ask us, Father, to love in all of these ways. Help us, Lord, to love like you. Help us today, Lord, to put away jealousy, to put away envy, to learn to love with abandon, to love you, to love those in our lives, to love the unlovable, and to love ourselves, Lord. Help us to do all of these things. And we'll give you the praise, Lord. We'll give you the praise. In Jesus' name, amen. We're going to sing one more very, maybe too familiar song, but I thought... Uh, you know, I was going to retire for a little while, but when I was thinking about this, I thought, um, we need to sing this song, Who You Say I Am, because you might be thinking, oh, I, I was jealous about this, or I did that, or I did, you know, in the past, or, and, and you need to understand um, that, that you are God's chosen child, that he loves you with a jealous love, and we need to understand that that's exactly who we are in Christ. And so, uh, as we prepare to leave, let's stand if you're able. Remain seated if you need to. That's fine. And uh, I want you to sing these words or meditate on these words. But this is a, a massive, massive truth. Who am I that the highest
And may God, with a jealous love, protect you, love you, guide you, hold you until we're able to gather again in His name. Amen. Amen. Have a blessed day, everybody. Have the best day that you can. <laughs>